somebody's ghost has invaded Kenyan politics in 2021. It is a political ghost that only older Kenyans can recognize because they were there living in this country called Kenya when that ghost was alive almost 20 years ago. And this thing that has come back as a ghost and invaded our politics was not a very good thing. It tortured Kenyans. It harmed Kenyans. Many people suffered fighting it. Yeah, but now the ghost is back, threatening to control our politics. And many Kenyans have fallen for the sweet words, sweet lies, sweet nothings. This ghost is whispering into their ears. I know you can already guess what I'm talking about. And even if you do, I am sure you don't understand how it has infiltrated our politics and how it is a threat to our politics and to a better Kenya. So stay with me in this video and find out the disturbing truth. Karibu sana. As a serious political analyst, you'll always come across mysteries. Things that you can clearly see, but you cannot explain. I don't like mysteries. Okay, granted, you cannot solve all the mysteries yeah, in politics, but I don't like them. So what I do is that I do my best to solve as many of them. Because the more mysteries I solve, the more I understand, and therefore the more accurate my analysis will be. Now there's this mystery that I've noted, especially in recent weeks. Older Kenyans, those who are around during the days of Moi, tend to all get very annoyed by some certain politicians. They get my feelings and they get worked up, yeah, sometimes to the extreme, when certain politicians do certain things and talk in a certain way. Just to give you a few names of the politicians who tend to annoy these older Kenyans. Kalonzo Musyoka, William Samoy Ruto, and a few others, but I believe those two names enough to get my point across. Now what do these two politicians have in common? Oh, and we can add the name of Msalem Davadi to that list, making it three. Although the Mudavadi case is complicated. But let's just include it. What do these three politicians have in common? They all served in prominent visible positions some of them very powerful, under the Moy regime. They were Kanu people. That was the clue which gave me a breakthrough in understanding yeah, these older Kenyans and the fact that they are getting annoyed, seemingly unnecessarily. Now relax. I'm not going to give you a long lecture of what Kanu politics was all about. I'm going to keep it very brief and to the point. Kanu politics was all about muscle. Kifua politics, if I can call it. Just to illustrate it further, this was the exact opposite 
of the politics of one great son of Kenya called Kenneth Matiba because he was all about the people. Let the people decide. And this explains why Matiba became very popular very suddenly that he took many in the political class completely by surprise. And it is human nature. People were tired of this muscle politics. Matiba was a breath of fresh air, something completely different. In muscle politics, Kanu politics, you still go to the people. But going to the people is the last thing you do. Yeah, you gain the muscle first, and then when you go before the people, they will respect the muscle, the power you wield, and they'll support you. Let's take a practical example from one of these names. William Samoy Ruto was a nobody. He was unknown. And somebody took pity on him and included him in the youth for Kano outfit. Ruto was not even an official. But one day he got the chance to speak at a meeting. And people were amazed at the way it seemed to come so naturally to him. Yeah, the very quiet man who never spoke much, seemed to be transformed when he was before a crowd. He almost became a different person. And that is how Ruto gained his muscle. And so when he went to the ground to campaign for the first time, he had the muscle. People had seen him speak on behalf of Youth for Kanu 92, YK 92. The assumption was that he was very close to the powers that be. Yeah. The truth was that he had just been a mutuam mkono, a messenger, for bigwigs like Gideon Moyer at the time and Cyrus Njirongo. The public didn't know that. They just knew that Ruto was connected. Ruto must be close to these powerful people. And that's how he got his start. Let me give you another quick example. How did Kalonzo Musyoka get started in politics? He tried on his own first and failed. And so he went to see a Kanu bigwig called Mulu Mutisia. Mulu Mutisia was not a cabinet minister. He was not in government, but he had positioned himself as the king of Ukambani, the Kanu king of Ukambani. And being Moe's point man, in Ukambani, there was nothing you could do in Ukambani without first going through Mulu Mutisia. An illiterate man, many ambitious lawyers like Mutula Kelonzo Sr. did not have time for people like Mulu Mutisia. What do you discuss with an illiterate man? But Kelonzo Musioko was persistent and very soon Mulu Mutisia noticed him. And what really excited Mulu Mutisia was the fact that this very educated man, according to Mulu Mutisia, had time for him, respected him, could kneel down before him. That was the old Kanu gesture yeah, of submission that could get you very far. And under the wing of Mulu Mutisia, Kalonzo Musioka got his muscle. Because everybody knew that Mulu Mutisia had the president's ear. And Kalonzo Musioka returned to the same constituency where he had lost. And this time he won easily. And still being under the wing of Mulu Mutisia, he got an appointment to a national seat in Kano. I believe assistant organizing secretary. Yeah, but it was enough muscle for him in Ukambani. And the rest is history. Now it is said that it is impossible to teach an old dog new tricks. The Kanu days ended almost 20 years ago. But what do you expect Kanu orphans to do? Their politics has never been about the people. So do you expect them to change overnight and suddenly... Their politics is about the people. How? And now you can understand the politics of Kanu orphans very well.
very easily, clearly. Kalonzo Musyoka wants to be president. And in his bid for the presidency, he wants Raila Odinga to give him some muscle. He wants Raila to say Kalonzo Tosha. That has not gone very well. So the latest from Kalonzo Musyoka is that he wants Raila Odinga to retire with Huru Kenyatta and leave politics and not vie in the 2022 elections. Just like in 2013, he wanted Uhuru Kenyatta and William Samoy Ruto out of the way, out of politics. Wamalizane na Mamboyao ya Hague while he becomes president, with less competition and less obstacles on the road to him being president. It's all from the Kanu rule book. Those who cannot give you muscle and are obstacles need to be removed out of the way doesn't matter how, so that your path is smooth, direct, build a stress to whatever post you want. You will notice the people, the voters, don't feature in that calculation. Yeah, they come in last. William Samoy Ruto gained his muscle yeah, for national politics by being associated fast with Ray Laudinga. In 2007, in 2013, he got his muscle by being associated with Huru Kenyatta. And his strategy to win the 2022 presidency is a replica of Moy's strategy in winning presidential elections in 1992 and 1997 but especially 1992. To summarize that strategy in one sentence, it is as follows. Infiltrate the opposition and then use money to buy support from kingpins all over the country. Very few Kenyans will resist hard cash. Now I can hear some older Kenyans yeah, responding to me as follows. Infiltrate the opposition? How exactly did Moy do that? I don't remember. Please, Chris, remind me. Okay. You remember after the 1992 general elections, we had very many defections from the opposition back to Kano, Mama na Baba. And Kenyans were very upset and also puzzled. Especially because these defections were from opposition strongholds. Central Kenya, House of Mumbi, Nyanza, Luo Nyanza. I remember the time, I was still very young, I just couldn't wrap my mind around the fact that a Ford Asili legislator, that was Kenneth Matiba's party, had actually defected back to Kano. How did that happen? Well, there's a simple answer. These politicians who defected were not given money after the elections. No. Their campaigns were financed right from the word go by Moy and Kano. Moy handlers knew very well that there was no way they were going to win an election in an opposition stronghold. And if they rigged that election, it would be too obvious. So they did the next best thing. They financed somebody, a popular candidate, to vie in those opposition strongholds on an opposition ticket with the understanding in advance that after the elections, they would defect. There would be a by-election, yes, but a by-election is very different from the general elections. Easy to manipulate. Low turnout, etc., etc. I'm sure that tactic sounds very familiar. Remember 2017, when it was very obvious? Muhammad Ali in Nyali constituency? 
You know, I've had some people discussing coast region voting. And they're talking about the votes being split between Ray Laudinga and William Samoy Ruto. And of course, they're not talking about how the coast has been so consistent in who they're supporting. Over many years, over decades, and the evidence is now right before your eyes. In 2017, William Samoy Ruto was forced to sponsor a candidate to vie on an opposition ticket, ODM. And when that failed, they vied on an independent ticket. But everybody saw that politician as an opposition politician. And that's why they voted for them. There is no way they would have been voted for had they vied on a jubilee ticket. That should be obvious. By the way, another candidate sponsored by William Samoy Root in 2017 at the coast was Aisha Jumwa, in case you didn't know. So, to explain why older Kenyans get annoyed is because they are seeing canoe things right before their eyes. Kanu tactics, Kanu habits, Kanu attitude, especially the Kanu attitude. That is proving to be very annoying for those Kenyans who are around during the Kanu days. Because those are days people want to forget quickly. Yeah, at least the politics, not the way of life, the politics of Kanu, the Kifua politics that so many Kenyans lost their lives fighting against. I really hope that I've solved that mystery for you. And not only that, I also hope that things are much clearer in your mind, politically, about our situation in Kenya. For avoidance of doubt, let me just spell it out for you. If you vote for Kalonzo Musyoka to be president, you're actually voting for Kano the old Kano that we got rid of over 20 years ago. If you're a supporter of UDA and you vote for the presidential candidate, you're voting for Kano. I know many of you are not there. You only read about this stuff in history books. But trust me, you don't want to go back to those days. But of course it's your choice. Yeah, there are those who believe that having a strong dictatorial government is good for development. There are Kenyans who seriously believe that, and I know some of them. A vote from Salim Davadi is a vote for the old Kano. That's the truth. I know some of you may still not be convinced, and so let me end with this. Why would somebody want another politician? To retire? Why would somebody want another politician to say their name Tosha when they have been in politics for decades? Why didn't they go to the ground and get their own loyal supporters like that person yeah, who they want to say their name Tosha? Why place so much emphasis on forming coalitions? That don't make sense. Because as you form those coalitions, you yourself do not have the numbers, do not have the number of votes to bring to the table and join with those of another yeah, so that you can become president. Just think about that for a minute. Ray Laudinga is human, but he has got such widespread, solid support countrywide. Why don't you go out and do the same for yourself if you want to become president? And even if you smelt the coffee very late, since 2017, what have you been doing yeah, to increase your support countrywide? Would I be wrong in saying that actually what you are doing was waiting for 2021 to go back to that other person and tell them it is their turn to support you? It is their turn for them to say, 
so and so Tosha, and then you become president. But of course, those people cannot do that because you can't teach an old dog new tricks. These are Kanu orphans. Let's look at another type of Kanu orphan. Why would you want to distribute money the way it was distributed in 1992 by Kanu countrywide, buying leaders left, right, and center, using all kinds of tricks to get crowds at your rallies, bribing people to attend your rallies, etc., etc. Why would you want to do that? And yet you have been deputy president. You are in a position of power. At least until 2016, you had three years to use your position to go around the country and gain genuine support from Kenyans by using your power to do something for them yeah, so that you don't have to use so much money dishing it out left, right and center in order to get support. And by the way, it is also the Kanu Party which introduced that game of opinion polls. The Kanu opinion polls showed Moi ahead yeah, from the beginning to the end, yeah, to just before the general elections. There's no single opinion poll released where Moi was not ahead. And we know so far, there's no single opinion poll that has been released to date, correct me if I'm wrong, where William Samoy Ruto has not been leading. Kanu orphans. That's all it is. Those older Kenyans who have been feeling very irritated, yeah, I hope I've explained your irritation very clearly in my video today. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.